Sonic Boom episode 35, Blackout. We start out seeing Comedy Chimp talk to the audience, and he makes me worry by saying he'd like to get serious for a moment. I was worried that he was talking to us, and that the episode would be dedicated to some real person's memory. But fortunately, he just talks about a sub for some reason. So why do you want to get serious? That was a coarse joke. There's a blackout, and somehow that makes the sky and everything around everyone go dark too. And an old man gets hurt. That doesn't make sense. Tails has some luminescent suits that the heroes are already wearing, so the heroes glow in the dark just fine. And they decide to break into Eggman's base and accuse Eggman of turning off the electricity. I thought the reason the sky went dark was because someone put a dome above the town, like in that episode of The Simpsons. But that makes sense, it'd be intimidating of Eggman, so we can't have that. Even though Sonic X did it just fine. Eggman says he's not responsible for the blackout. Then Tails says that's not like Eggman to shut off his air conditioning, believing him. No other continuity would have Eggman be just as much the victim of the plot as the villagers. Then Styx accuses the mayor of lying, with Sonic being scared that he keeps agreeing with her, and says that he should go see a doctor, and somehow Styx isn't offended by that. She never reacts at all. The mayor reveals out of nowhere that their village is powered by an ancient crystal, and he says that he shouldn't have put it behind a secret door that can only be opened with electricity. But then he immediately opens it without electricity, just by pushing on the damn wall. Somehow, its electrical power is now drained, so he tells Sonic to get another crystal. So it's a magic crystal, but there's only so much energy in it? Huh? But why was there any energy in it to begin with? So it doesn't have to make sense that there's energy in it, but it still follows the laws of physics because it still has a finite amount of energy. I love that Tails is writing to Zoe about their trek through a blizzard-filled mountain. But wait, how did he mail those letters? And it's ridiculous that I'm expected to believe the heroes would take days trekking through the place. Sonic can run at the speed of sound. He'd have gotten to their destination in seconds. He'd just get pointed in the right direction. Sonic's told off for only just now mentioning that his hover car is in snowstorm mode. When did he get this motorcycle? Probably from the mayor's paying him for his heroism. And he pulls the other heroes along because they're skiing holding ropes behind it. I like the guitar music. But seriously, there's no way they wouldn't have just done this in the first place instead of taking a week to get here. It's a tropical island! How big is it? Amy conveniently is able to read the message of the ancients, which suggests entering it with the lazy way. The lazy way apparently isn't Sonic smashing his way in and the heroes get covered in snow. Tails complains that his letter got ruined, and then he says it takes centuries to figure out the right combination. I guess the door is just made of such tough material that Tails couldn't just tell Sonic to carry him to his house, get a ray gun, and blast through the door that way. Then somehow Knuckles gets in immediately by trying the lazy way, but what'd he do? He just sat on some snow. There's no way that anyone would make a lock that can be easily opened by an idiot. The heroes walk into an ancient Egyptian-like tomb, and they're told by a golem with a blue torch on its head that's magically always lit that they'll have to overcome three riddles, not including the one outside. So I hope the golems are always asleep unless they're visitors, because otherwise they'd have a really boring life here with nothing to do. Styx is admirable as she wishes they could ignore him and tries to attack him even though she has no reason to think she'd be effective. But it does make me wonder why Sonic doesn't just run behind the golems at the speed of sound. But I guess all the doors are closed until they solve the riddles. Amy accepts his arbitrary challenge, and he teleports away, and one of the golems tells them to tell him how many sides does a circle have. Styx has a snarky remark, and the room gets filled with red gas, which makes them cough. And they somehow don't die immediately. Tails says that a circle is round, so it has no sides. Knuckles says that a circle has two sides, inside and outside. It's correct, as the answer was a riddle. There's a dark moment as Tails had to wake up from unconsciousness and ask if he solved it. Then after Styx snarks again, because apparently she didn't learn her lesson the first time, Tails doesn't know how to answer the next riddle because he's too literal minded. So it has to be the creative Knuckles to save the day. He says there'll be dust in the wind which is the correct answer, right as they're about to be sent falling to their dooms by a moving floor. 
but Tails can fly. Knuckles should be able to glide and climb, so this should be just fine. Then the next golem gives him another riddle, and he says a poem. She says that he has a good rhyme and meter, and thus she sees why he's the final guard. And somehow, her complimenting him gets a trap activated too. The heroes get surrounded by statues that try to crush them, and Six keeps telling Knuckles to hurry up. It turns out that silence is the correct answer, but there's no way that Knuckles would say something as formal as silence to get his friends to shut up. How fucking robotic are these golems? I mean, they should be able to tell from the context that Knuckles is only giving correct answers by accident most of the time. Was there a prophecy saying that only Knuckles is allowed to get the power crystal? Of course, despite Sonic swapping the crystal with something of equal weight he happened to have, the cliché happens anyways and they have to run out of the place when a ceiling is falling. I actually would have found it less predictable if that didn't happen, but tension is good. But it's of course very artificial tension because it's a kind where none of the heroes are allowed to get hurt, or else they never make it out of there. So what's the point? The crystal falls out of Sonic's motorcycle and Knuckles grabs it in his big mitten that looks like a baseball glove. And then it turns out the civilians are rioting, holding torches. An ice cream shopkeeper tells them to stay back. This is cool, I love that they're acting that way with dramatic music. I say it's cool because it makes me wonder, have they been brainwashed into rioters? Is this an evil plan of Eggman's because the heroes weren't in the town? But then the heroes give the mayor's new crystal and the rioters just cheer and calm down. Never mind. I thought the heroes would be returning to an epic new story where they had to defeat a villain that manipulated the villagers. They started rioting with torches way too easily then. They should know that that wouldn't solve the problem of the blackout. Wouldn't Eggman have taken over the village in the week the heroes have been away? Constantly ransacked it with his robots? Orbot and Cubot haven't run out of power, I think. I think they would have ran out of power in this time, from what Eggman Unplugged told us. Wouldn't Eggman have, at the very least, built a brand new way to get power for the village? In fact, we saw him generate power for his base with solar panels one time, so why didn't he just do that again? And get power over the village by forcing people to get power from him or else? The story ends with Sonic admitting that Boom Knuckles is a lot smarter than they give him credit for, and the video mercifully ends before he could open his mouth to say something forced to contradict that. Why did he even say that when it was obvious most of Knuckles' answers were accidental? This episode was an intriguing one where the heroes have to travel to get a magical MacGuffin. Although that is a very cliché fantasy plot, it was at least a fantasy plot for a change, which actually takes advantage of the fact that it's the Sonic series. But that doesn't change the fact that it felt forced and out of nowhere that a town full of mundane plots with almost no fantasy in sight was all along powered by ancient magical crystals instead of just a regular power plant. And the mayor has to ask Sonic to get another one for him. This somehow doesn't immediately lead to Sonic getting to his destination with a super speed in 5 seconds. And then having to go back and get his friends because he can't open the door. It's so forced that it took the heroes a week to get here. This is an island! How much space could there be on it? Sonic would have run to the door at the speed of sound, run back, picked up his friends and carried them at Sonic speed one by one. It'd be seconds, not a week. I guess the logic was that if he moved at super speed, even while carrying someone in a freezing cold mountain, the resulting wind chill moving past them at Sonic speed would kill them. But he could just have them covered by a blanket. He could be completely covered. That's not even mentioning the fact that the heroes being gone from town for a week has no consequences at all, like Eggman taking over the town. There's no way he'd put up with no electricity for a week. He'd have made his own electrical generator a long time ago instead of relying on the same electricity source as the town, and I guess not paying an electric bill because he threatens the mayor, which is why he has electricity at all. Also, the mayor having to ask the heroes for help made me wonder how he and the previous mayors ever got new power crystals, because apparently they don't have any backups immediately accessible from their house. And Sonic needs to risk his life going through a riddle-solving underground death trap to get even one. And realistically, most people would have died in this place even if they got to the underground area, because the answers to the riddles require making puns and thinking weirdly. And Sonic only got one crystal out of the deal, so where's the other ones? And if this was where the mayor's crystal came from, why did he just take one crystal instead of both? I would have liked to learn where the Mayor's Crystal did come from then. The plot would have made way more sense if they just kept it simple and had Tails detect the Chaos Crystal from its sheer amount of power crashing into the planet from a meteor. 
It had to go find it before Eggman would. But then it wouldn't have felt creative at all. I love that Knuckles was useful, but it was mostly just by accident, like from responding to Six. And the Golem should have understood that and killed them anyways. It would have made sense if they just said that there was a prophecy that the one who really deserves the crystal is the one who would give the exact same answers that Knuckles would give them. Because it's not like you have to be a good righteous person to give the answers to the riddles that Knuckles did. So, how does that make sense? Episode 35-2, Unnamed Episode. That's the laziest, most confusing name ever. I hope they submitted that name because they couldn't think of an actual name on time. We start out with the mayor telling people in his office that the village's giant ball of twine, its former tourist trap, was unwound by Sonic. And the crowd boos him even though he says he had to do it to stop a rock slide. Why has it taken this long for there to be any sort of consequences to him doing that though? Is this show in weird chronological order where this takes place right after that episode? People want the town to get a better tourist trap. And somehow, somehow, the villagers don't know the name of their own town. Not even the mayor knows. Tail says that their town was originally called Badgerville, ruled by a ruthless badger who got in power by manipulating the system, like the mayor, and kicked people out of their homes to develop on the land and expand his fortune. But eventually people tore down the town sign after chasing him out and were too lazy to hang up a new sign. That's hard to believe. Talk about an ass pull to explain away why the town has no name. It would take three seconds for them to come up with a new name. I'm pretty sure you can't legally get away with doing this. Six is upset because Jebediah Badger was her ancestor. How the hell does she know any of her ancestors when she's an orphan who raised herself? She was an idiot loudly proclaiming in front of everyone that she was related to Jebediah. It's very forced that she did that just to force the concept of all the people glaring at Sticks for being related to him. In fact, they actually run away from her in fear, even after she told them that he likes everything she's against. This is very stupid. So people try to figure out what the town's name should be. And Amy gets to think of a name that everyone agrees with because she's a creator's pet. Sometimes the writers favoritize her, and sometimes they just make her a bitch. Eggman then out of nowhere says to let the people decide, right after he announces a potential name. Then to be intentionally obstructive, he pressures people to have a referendum about the new name. Someone's mean to Styx again, and I wonder why she's still outside at this point. You'd think a paranoid person would stay inside. But by this point, I'm so used to the civilians in the show being awful that it barely registers to me. It's not like these are civilians that I'm used to being nice. Then somehow, a lot of people are happy with Eggman's stall as music plays. And Orbot has to tell people to calm down because there's enough for everyone. But it's Eggman! Amy goes to a library and is told that this isn't a library, so they leave. I'm really happy to see Amy get a smear campaign political ad against her. But sadly, literally all it did was make fun of her for associating with Styx, who's called a conspiracy theorist. Did I need any more proof that Amy was being favoritized? The writer was so overly attached to her that he couldn't bear to have her be insulted for something legitimate that's wrong with her. Like the fact that she's always insulting Sonic. Instead of doing that, they just insult some other character instead. And Six says she can't take it anymore. But this won't lead to something dark happening because this is a forced, light-hearted kids show. They don't have her say this if it's not going to be foreshadowing anything. Then somehow Eggman City won. Eggman says that he was happy that everyone voted without reading the proposition itself. Even though it should have been obvious what his proposition was. In fact, didn't he tell people what he wanted the name of the town to be? Wouldn't they all assume that his name would be terrible? So why would they ever take the risk of approving his name? The news reporter says that they were swayed by his free shirts and stuff. What kind of free stuff from Eggman could possibly be worth it? And it turns out that people signed something that just made him have ultimate power over the town. I wish this show had episodes for a proper length instead of just 11 minutes. Because this is an exciting idea. Eggman sends a demolition tractor to clear space for his new theme park. And he says the villagers can work at the theme park. He had good points there. This would make a tourist trap. 
Somehow, all of the heroes refuse to come with Amy when she goes to the library to try to find a way to stop Eggman legally. What the hell kind of freedom fighters are these people? Just because Eggman's got legal power, they don't try to fight him anymore? That's not how it works. Imagine if they did that in Sad AM. Or Archie. Or Underground. I hate how boring and long the montage of her reading is. It's just the same thing over and over. Can't they just not do this? Then she tells Six that Jebediah never relinquished ownership of the land. So legally, the land belongs to his only descendant, Styx. But does this mean that the town used to be a monarchy? But it had a mayor system. And there's no way that someone else wouldn't be able to relinquish ownership of the land for him after he got run out of town. Six reveals she believes pod people can replace people, talking about a concept oddly similar to the infiltrator idea in Archie. Then Amy tells the crowd that none of their votes mattered. Six then says something that makes them cheer, and then they boo Amy because she mentioned the library. Eggman then sends a bunch of ball bots at everyone, and runs over the ice cream parlor with his demolition tractor. I don't understand why Eggman's rule had to be so damn short. All that time at the episode that was wasted on Amy Rose reading. They were so fascinated by the character. The plot was intriguing the minute Eggman shut down the media, though it was stupid to do that because it just made people mad and want to overthrow him. Somehow, I'm not sure how, Eggman's tractor is forced to keep moving backwards before it could destroy his house. Barely anything happened in this so-called action scene. That's not a climactic payoff. Then Six decides to name the town Hedgehog Village. Somehow she's not naming after Sonic, the main character of the series, and instead after Amy, creator's pet alert. Because somehow, Amy's full name of the show is Amy Rose the Hedgehog, so we're getting Archie Sonic here all of a sudden. I never liked this name. Her last name is supposed to be Rose. Knuckles referenced his official character profile in an earlier episode, so wouldn't the show writers be aware of Amy's actual name from her profile? I mean, if her last name is the Hedgehog, wouldn't that mean she's related to Sonic the Hedgehog? It was sweet of Six to hug Amy, though, and say she's her best friend. Although I've never actually seen Amy be any more of a friend to Six than to anyone else in her group. And I've never seen Six be especially close to Amy or anyone else. It's really just an informed attribute, like Amy knowing what people want. By the way, I'd like to point out that I actually remember seeing the scene where Six named the town after Sonic when I walked into the living room when my nephew was watching the show. I specifically remember thinking it was stupid that Amy had that full name, and I immediately left the room because I wanted to watch the show in chronological order, not like that. Turns out I left right before the episode ended. I hate how meta it is that they had an episode dedicated to the town not having a name, just because the audience didn't know it. Really? Sadi M had its village have a name. I'm pretty sure almost every single franchise in existence gets its main location a proper name. It speaks to how lazy this continuity is, and how uninvested the writers are, that it took until now for us to learn that its name is Badgerville. I absolutely refuse to believe that the townspeople don't know its name. Its name would be in the legal documents. The mayor would know the name. The news would be mentioning it. And if Tails can just learn its name from the internet in five seconds, then people not knowing its name is even stupider. They're only ignorant of this because the audience was. Well, I'm really glad the name of the village is a simple, easy to remember name. I remember an episode where the heroes panicked because some missile was heading for a village with a bad name that started with G, and I was worried that that was the name of this town. Maybe it was the name of the Guilt Trippers town instead. I was already spoiled about the fact that Styx has an ancestor a long time ago in a comment section. But it came as a surprise to me that she was ashamed of him, and that he was an evil mayor who represented everything Styx is against. I always assumed that if they were going to give any of the main characters a relative, they would get to meet them, and they'd have actual dialogue. But instead he's just a posthumous character whose only impact on the plot is that people hate Styx and want to change the town's name. It's stupid of them to hate her for being related to someone when she's a well-known hero, they should know it's nothing like him. But it is realistic for people to resent people for their ancestors. But how many of those people are literal heroes? It was forced that people all voted for Eggman's name for the city instead of completely ignoring him out of spite or even throwing tomatoes at him. Sure, he offered them free stuff, 
but any stuff offered by Eggman would be ignored, or even accused of having explosives in it. Or brainwashing pollen, or chemicals. Instead, they all signed his paper to get it, and unwittingly made him ruler of the city, because he snuck a clause in his own paper. This got me excited right away for all the story potential that would have. Especially when he banned the media and shut down the television. I guess because he's too oversensitive to handle criticism of him and took a preemptive strike. Villainy's not really meant for him, then, if he can't handle being criticized. But sadly, the writers favoritized Amy so much that they wasted a gigantic amount of time in the episode on Amy reading library books while forgettable music played. What the hell were they thinking? Instead of us getting to see all the different ways that Eggman's rule was affecting the town, which I immediately looked forward to, we get worthless padding that could've just consisted of three seconds. If this was AOSTH, I think we would've gotten a lot more out of this idea. For example, in the episode where Eggman wants to use brainwashing pollen, the whole plot is about him succeeding in using it, to the point where he uses it on Sonic. And in the episode where he wants to slow Sonic down with the ray, the whole episode is that he succeeded, and now Tails has to save him. That's an episode structure that actually works. But the show always goes with the idea that Eggman has a plan, and it never even gets off the ground. But it was way more climactic and satisfying to have Eggman at least get a leg up first before he fails. Eggman has a plot from the beginning, and it focuses on that plot and how it affects the heroes the whole episode. That's why that's a more intuitive form of storytelling for an action series. It's never intuitive that Eggman keeps wanting to build a theme park, and yet never does in the show. Because that's foreshadowing that never comes true then. And the same goes from becoming the ruler. He finally becomes one, but it feels off that there's almost no focus on it. So all Eggman really does is try to tear down the heroes' homes to build a theme park. And it gets foiled by being forced to drive backwards. That was unsatisfying. I'd expect a better payoff than that. Amy has to save the day by herself because her friends are too cowardly to stand up to Eggman the Tyrant when they're supposed to be freedom fighters. Wow, Amy was shown way too much preference in this episode. I can understand showing preference to a character if they're legitimately a great character, like if they're really useful in a variety of different ways, and they've got an admirable, likable personality. But Amy's not any of those things, so it's baffling that she'd be shown any kind of preference. All she did was read library books. Is that really considered entertaining for the show? Apparently so, because she's Amy. So only she got to save the day. And Styx is apparently the legal successor to her ancestor, as if the town used to be a monarchy. But the government system clearly changed since then because the mayor isn't related to her. So how is the ancient law still binding when the town has elections? And seriously, there's a reason this always fell off. How does Styx even know about any of her family members when that's completely detached from the fact that she's an orphan who had to raise herself in the wild? Then why didn't she find her grandparents, at least? Or one of her aunts or uncles or cousins? Do you know how unlikely it is that not only do none of the main cast have parents, but they also don't have any aunts, uncles, grandparents, nephews, or cousins? Somehow, every single one of them is an orphan abandoned by their parents, and they never use DNA testing to find their family afterwards. I guess DNA testing is how Styx knows about her ancestor. I mean, she would be paranoid, so she'd want to find out about her family just in case they have genetic diseases of any kind. But she still doesn't spend time with any of her surviving relatives on screen. To be fair, they wouldn't want her around anyways because she's a conspiracy theorist. So if we saw her try to connect with them, it'd just be sad. But still, the point is that unless her entire family line was all wiped out, and somehow she was the only surviving descendant, it makes no sense that her family just consists of her and her ancestor, with nothing in between. So her having an ancestor causes her to make even less sense. Because now we know she has a family history attached to this town. So where are her parents and grandparents to connect her to that ancestor? When Six was getting all excited about how she owned every bit of the town, I was wondering how they could ever justify getting back to the status quo after that. Because why would she just immediately give up ownership of the town then? But she just immediately returns ownership to the people. She doesn't even say that she doesn't want to be responsible for the sewer system, which she said earlier. She really wanted to find out if there were paw people in the town. So you think she would have tried to find them first, and then returned to the town. But I bet there aren't, because that would be an interesting story that would actually take advantage of the sci-fi fantasy genre.